Now, to tell you a bit about myself, I know that Pastor Rufus has mentioned, um, but I was, and someone said this today, I was incubated at this church. I think, I think that was a really nice word. So my husband and I moved to um, Hyderabad in, I think it was 2012, and we came to Hope UC. It was Pell City Church then. And we were very fresh and didn't know anyone, and Pastor Mayuri immediately just embraced me and she made sure I was connected to people. I felt so welcome, we had to come back. We had to come back. And you know, I was really lonely and I needed friends because we'd just moved from my husband's hometown. So I wanted to be part of a mother's group. There was no mother's group, but Pastor Mayuri encouraged me to start a mother's group. So with her encouragement, we started, or I started, and the first two people to come to the, my mother's group was Pastor Mayuri and Pastor Rufus. Pastor Rufus was so nice, he came and he joined in as well. Um, but I can honestly say that it was a time of incubation, those five years there, a time of really stepping out into who God had called me to be, figuring out what he had placed inside of me. Five years later, we got to move to Vizag. We felt God calling us to go and plant a church in Vishakhapatnam. And we also work with Christian schools. We have a Christian school there. There's one in Amalapuram, my husband's hometown, which is going to be a boarding school. And we also have an online Christian school as well. And I don't know if you have a picture of me and my, my family. I have three beautiful daughters, Grace, Bella and Hannah, who used to come to Sunday school here as well. So I'm so blessed to be back with you. You know, when um, Pastor Mayuri asked me to share today, I was really praying about what God had on his heart for everyone here. And he gave me a topic, and I was really excited about this topic. And I tell you what this topic is. God told me today to speak about the topic of repentance. Now, don't all clap at once. I know, I know that might sound not so exciting. You know, if you were there for the first service at 10 o'clock, we had Leela Chandi preaching about grace. Maybe you should have gone to that service instead of this one. But God has put on my heart to speak about repentance, and I'm actually excited about it. God has given me a revelation, and I really want to share this with you. Now, I'm sure when we think of the word repentance, we think about a message that's going to make you all feel very, very bad about yourselves. And I'm not here today to do that. We have so many kind of connotations that we have when we connect to the word repentance. If I said I was here to talk about the good news, I'm sure you'd all be so excited because the good news is good, right? It's really good that Jesus loves us so much that he came down from the, his throne and he came to take away all our sin, our shame, our condemnation and he exchanged it with his righteousness. He gave us his righteousness and now we get to know that we are part of the kingdom of God. We can be part of the kingdom of God in relationship with God forever and that is good news. That is such good news. But did you know that before we can embrace the good news and understand it and accept it, we first have to consider this idea of repentance. And Jesus himself spoke about this. In Mark 1.15, it says that Jesus was preaching from village to village. And he says this, the time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come there, repent and believe the good news. He didn't just say believe the good news. He said, first repent and then believe the good news. And the other apostles preached just the same. In Peter, Acts 2.38, He's given the same message. He says, repent and be baptized. First we repent. And Paul preached the same message. In Acts 26, 20, Paul says, I preach that they should repent and turn to God. And so before we can embrace the good news, we have to first encounter this idea of repentance. And why is that? Why is repentance so important for us to be able to then grasp the good news? And I believe that John the Baptist showed us why in his coming. In Mark 1 verse 4 it says, And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Now I want you to imagine what it might have been like at that time if we, you know, if you are a husband or a wife and you decided you're going to go down to see and listen to John's message and John is saying, you guys have a sin problem and you need to turn away from your sin. You guys have a sin problem. 
And he would say, come into the river and let that be a symbol of God washing away your sins because that's what he wants to do. And so the person would listen to the message, be convicted, yes, I am a sinner, I have lots of sins. And they would go into the river and they would get clean and they would come out and they'd feel really good about themselves and they'd have a towel around them because they're wet and they'd go to their husband or their wife and then they would say, where's my clothes? I left them here. And then the husband and wife would say, but why do I always have to take care of your clothes? It's not, it's not my business. You can never keep your things safe. And then the other one would say, but you never help me. You're never there to support me. And then I think, the husband and wife would think, do you know what? I think I need to get back into that river. I think I need to get back into that river again because they would have had an argument. And I wonder how people felt after they went into that river and they, and they were cleansed and they were washed clean, that they came out, but then they realized, actually, this was an ongoing problem that just couldn't be solved. It just couldn't be solved. So what does the word repentance mean? What does it mean? The Greek word for repentance is metanoia. Metanoia. And it means to change one's mind, to change one's mind. And I'm not talking about changing your mind when you go to like Baskin Robbins and, you, and they ask you, you know, what flavor ice cream do you want? And you say, mint choc chip, and they're about to put it on. You say, no, no, actually, I think I'll have, I think I'll have the lemon flavor. I don't mean that kind of change in your mind. I mean the changing of mind when we are one place and we completely turn around, 180 degree turn to somewhere else. We really change what we believed or thought. So we have to understand that repentance is not a feeling, it's not making you feel bad, I feel bad, and it's not a ritual, something that we have to do or an action. It's just a changing of our minds. It's just a changing of our minds. And you know, for too long, the devil has lied to us about what this idea of repentance is, that sometimes we actually shy away from it and we don't really wanna deal with it. It makes us feel uncomfortable. But I believe that God wants to give us a revelation of how beautiful this idea of repentance is today. And we're gonna do that by looking at three understandings about sin, three understandings about sin and four truths about repentance. So three understandings about sin. You know, in the Bible, in the Bible, there are three words that are used for the word sin. The first is sin, okay? The first is sin. And the Hebrew word for sin is kata. The Hebrew word for sin is kata. And do you know that kata means to fail or to miss the goal? To fail or to miss the goal? And what goal is it that we miss? What goal is it that we fail to achieve? Well, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. It's the goal of the glory of God. You know, Jesus, God created us to be in His image. And he created us to love him with all of our heart, with all of our mind, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. And he created us to love our neighbor, not just as ourselves, but as Jesus has loved us. And that's his standard for us. And when we miss that mark, when we fail to hit that goal, that's called sin. And God wants us to change our minds about this. He wants us to change our minds about this. You know, I want to share something with you. In December 2019, my husband and I went on this wonderful marriage course. And you know, they had a time when they told us that we have to think about some things that we haven't confessed to each other yet and to repent of. And you know, if you had told me at the beginning of, of, that, um, of that course, I would have thought, well, you know, I've said sorry for everything that I need to say sorry for. You know, I've, I've done my part. But actually, they gave us a new understanding of this word sin, that it was when we failed to hit that goal. And I realized that sometimes when my husband and I had an argument and just say, you know, I just didn't have the strength or the energy to talk about it, I would hold things back just to avoid an argument and I would keep it to myself. But I learned that that was a sin because when I did that, I was actually harming our union. God had brought us together to be one. That was his purpose. That was his goal for our marriage. And so when I refused to communicate well with him, I was actually not hitting the goal. I was failing to make that mark and I was ru ruining our union. And so I really had to confess and repent of these things that I hadn't realized was sin before. 
And we have to understand, just because we feel sometimes, you know what, the, the world is horrific and we are so much better people, that it's not about our goal or our standards of what is sin and what it isn't. It's about his goal and what he says is his mark for us to achieve. So that's sin, the first word. The second word comes from the Hebrew word pesha. And that means it describes the breaking of a relationship or a betrayal of a relationship or even a revolt against a relationship. Habakkuk chapter 1 verse 13 says this, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You cannot tolerate wrongdoing. And so God created us to be in relationship with him. And when we sin, we break that relationship. And it's not that God runs away from us, it's that we push ourselves away from a very holy God, a holy, holy, holy God. And so that relationship is broken, it's broken. But listen to this, Isaiah 53 tells us that even though we are responsible when we sin for breaking our relationship with God, it says he was pierced for our transgressions. He was pierced, even though he didn't betray that relationship, he was pierced for our betrayal. And the third word used for sin is iniquity. The Hebrew word for iniquity is avon. Avon means to be bent or crooked or twisted. Now God created us to be right standing with him and righteous. But sometimes we actually choose to bend ourselves and turn towards wickedness. That's true, right? We choose wickedness instead. And there's a crookedness inside all of us. But listen to this, Isaiah 53 verse five also says that Jesus was crushed for our iniquities. So though we chose to be wicked, or though we choose to be wicked, and we should have been crushed by God because he didn't create us to be wicked, he took the crushing and he was crushed because we chose to be wicked. So sin, transgression, iniquity, we should have been crushed, we should have been pierced. But in this whole process of being transformed into the likeness of Jesus and having our sins washed and cleansed away from us, Jesus did all of the work. He did all of the work. And he says, your role in this it's just to change your mind. It's just to change your mind. And so today I wanna to share four truths about this word called repentance, four truths. The first is that repentance is not a punishment. It's not a punishment, it's actually a gift and it's a privilege. It's a gift and a privilege. You know, what do you think of when I say the word repentance? Do you think about shame and guilt do you feel that maybe you wanna beat yourself up? Do you feel that maybe you need to beg God for forgiveness? Maybe repentance brings you this idea of coming to church once a week, something we do before we receive communion. Maybe we imagine ourselves prostrating ourselves on the floor. You know, sometimes we see this as a ritualistic thing that we have to do. Or maybe this idea of repentance actually is something we struggle with because sometimes we feel Hopeless, we feel despairing that we want to change, but we're not able to, but we're not able to. Or maybe we just think it's as simple as just confessing our sins and believing God will take them away and just being so glad we are rid of them. But we know that the process of repentance is not about a feeling or an act, it's about a changing of our mind. And this was Jesus' desire for us, that we would change our minds about how we live and understand what He has given us and how He desires us to live. Now, if you would just call for some bottles to come up on stage, I wanna show you this example that, again, my husband and I saw when we were on our marriage conference and it was such, it's such a powerful example um, it was to us. You know, why is it, why is it, thank you, that just this simple act of changing our minds can be so powerful to transform us. Thank you, great. And I wanna give you this example. It's okay, no problem, no problem. I wanna give you this example that we learned in our, in our marriage conference, okay? I want you to imagine that this is our minds and our beliefs, okay? This is our minds and our beliefs, what we think and what we believe. And this is our feelings, how we act. 
sorry, this is our feelings, how we feel, and this is our actions, how we act, okay? So why is that that God is, desires to change how we live, but actually he talks about our minds and what we believe? Well, the truth is what we believe then affects how we feel, which then affects how we act, okay? So for example, if I feel that my husband doesn't love me enough, okay, if I believe that, if that's a belief that I have in my head, then how I feel would be I wouldn't feel very good about myself, I'd feel rejected, and I might even be a little bit bitter towards my husband. And so when he comes home from work and I believe that he doesn't really love me enough, the way that I will act towards him is maybe I'll seek a lot of attention, or maybe when he ignores me and he's busy reading his newspaper, I will start to get very angry and thump things around in the house. So what I believe affects what I feel, which eventually act, affects how I act. And the Bible actually agrees with this. It agrees with this in Romans 12 too. It says, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. You know, the, the Word tells us, and that's why we are to be feeding on the Word of God, applying the Word of God to our minds daily because it shapes what we believe and what we think, which then shapes how we act, which then shapes, sorry, how we feel and then shapes how we act. And that is the power of repentance. When we change our minds, we are actually being transformed. And isn't it so wonderful that God did all the hard work on the cross and he said, your job is just to change your mind and decide that you do not want to sin again. He came in, he washed us clean, gave us a robe of righteousness, took away the punishment and said, your job is just to repent. And so you have to understand repentance is not a punishment. It's a gift. It's a privilege. God did the hard part. And it's not that we have got to repent. It's that we get to repent. It's not that we have got to repent. It is that we get to repent. So that's the first truth that I believe that God wants us to understand about repentance today is that it is a gift and a privilege and not a punishment. And the second truth that I believe God wants us to embrace today is that God is not angry with you when you sin. He is not angry with you when you sin. How many times though do we think that God is angry with us? How many times are we trying to hide away from God because we think that we're just not worthy enough to come before Him? And you know, when we believe that, when we believe that, instead of going to Him and trying to repent and change our mind and going to Him and saying, Lord, I need your help, what we do instead is we run away from Him and we don't address our sin because we just feel too bad. We think He's gonna be angry with us. And so that sin doesn't get addressed. It doesn't get addressed. You know, I read something on Instagram the other day. Thank God for Instagram. It says this. It says, the devil says, you messed up. Your father is going to kill you. The gospel says, you messed up. You need your father. You need your father. And I want to share with you today the story of the Samaritan woman at the well. And I don't know why this story keeps coming up. It was, we, we heard it twice yesterday at the Shine Conference. I, I think God has this on his heart. But I'm going to be reading from John 4, verses 4 to 19. And then we're going to go on to verses 25 to 26. And it says this, Now he, Jesus, had to go through Samaria. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son, Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well. It was about noon. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water, Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into the town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, you are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, if you knew the gift of God and who it is that asks you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? 
Are you greater than our father Jacob, who gave us the well and drank from it himself, as also did his sons and his livestock? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give them will become in them a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. He told her, go, call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. Jesus said to her, you are right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you have had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you have just said is quite true. Sir, the woman said, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And you see her changing the subject very quickly. And on to verse 25, it says, the woman said, I know that Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I, the one speaking to you, I am he, I am he. So this Samaritan woman was not someone that Jesus should have been speaking to, okay? He was a teacher, she was a woman, he was male. She was also a Gentile. But on top of this, she had this shocking sin. And if you think about it, even in 2023, I'm sure many of us would maybe be on the phone if we heard about this story of the Samaritan woman and we'd be like, you know, hi Mary, I just wanted to tell you um, there's someone that you need to pray for. Did you know that the Samaritan woman at the well, you know, that she's, you know, she had five husbands, you know, please pray for her. You know, we, we, we would judge, right? We wouldn't be able to help it. In 2023, it's shocking. She had five husbands. Her sin is shocking. But what I love is that it didn't shock Jesus. You know, instead of avoiding this woman, he reached out to her. And this is the heart of Jesus. He reached out to her. And he didn't just reach out to her to see if he could help her. He offered the best thing that he could offer her. He offered her eternal life, living water. And that's his heart that he would give her eternal life and living water. You know, he has every right to judge her. We cannot judge anyone. Who are we to judge? But it says that Jesus is, will be sat on the throne of judgment. He had every right to condemn her and judge her. But he doesn't judge her. He didn't come to judge her. He didn't go there to judge her. He went there to save her and to reach out his hand and offer her eternal life. And that's what the Word tells us, right? In John 3, 16 to 17, some of the most famous verses in the Bible. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. That's his heart. That's his heart, not to condemn, but to save and to offer eternal life. So why do we think that God is judging us? Why do we run away from him? Why do we think that God is judging us? And I love that Jesus doesn't just seek the woman in us and he reaches out and he offers her this living water. And she wants to take it, right? She's like, wow, okay, give me this living water. But does he give it to her straight away? Uh-uh, he doesn't. Why? Because there's something that she needs to do first before she can take this gift of salvation. There's something that she needs to do first. It says that he tells her, where is your husband? And so for her to understand what the living water is really about, for her to understand that she really does have a sin problem, he first needs to convict her of her sin problem. And then she can realise that she really does need a saviour. And so that's what he does. He convicts her of a sin problem. And then she can understand that it's actually a saviour she needs. It's not the water. It's a saviour that she needs. It says in John 4, verses 28 to 30, it says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to the town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Messiah? They came out of the town and made their way towards him. You know, this woman has the option. She has the option. Should she just run away? Or should she let go of her jar and take hold of what Jesus is offering to her? And that, that jar that she has in her hand becomes a symbol of her sin. 
that she just leaves her sin. She chooses to let it go. And she chooses to take hold of this living water that Jesus is offering to her. You know, this woman is so excited. She understands what she's been given now. She's been convicted of a sin that she bears no shame or condemnation. She's so excited. She goes and tells her friends and she says, this man told me everything I ever did. And she has no shame in saying that because she knows she's been forgiven. She's found a real joy. She's found a real freedom from her old way of life. And that's good news that she cannot help but share. And that's the same good news that we have today. You know, God condemns every sin, but he doesn't condemn us. God seeks out the sinner, not to punish us, but to save us, but to save us, not to crush us, but to pull us up out of the mud and the dirt. And he doesn't look at how far from perfect we are or how much we've fallen. He looks at how far he wants to bring us, how far he wants to bring us. He doesn't look, us, look at us as condemned human beings that can never get anything right. He looks at us as his precious sons and daughters who he can't wait to welcome back into his arms. God doesn't condemn us when we sin. He doesn't condemn us when we sin. He convicts us and then he invites us to change. He invites us to change our minds. The second truth that we are to grasp is that God is not angry with us when we sin. And the third truth that I believe that God wants us to understand today is that when we are turning away from our sins, we need the help of the Holy Spirit. We cannot do it by ourselves. We need the help of the Holy Spirit. John 16 verses seven to nine says this, Jesus said, but very truly I tell you, it is for your good that I am going away. Unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you when he comes, he will prove the world, he will prove the world to be wrong, to be in the wrong about sin and righteousness and judgment. And so this Holy Spirit is our friend and our helper and our advocate, someone who goes to court and fights on behalf of us. He's our encourager, he's our helper, he's been given to us as a gift. And he's also been given to us to convict us. And it's not just of our sin that he confronts us with. He actually convicts us of the righteousness that we've been given. It's not just our sin that He convicts us of. He convicts us of the righteousness that's already been given to us in Christ Jesus. And we need His help. In John 16, verses 12 to 13, it says, Jesus says, I have much more to say to you, more than you can now bear. But when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. And the Holy Spirit is there to remind us what the Word of God says, that we are beloved, that He's already defeated sin on the cross, that He's taken away our sin, our shame and our punishment. We are just to believe and to grasp hold of the gifts that God has given us. And He gives us the Holy Spirit to remind us. And often we have the enemy whispering in our ear, God's angry at you, but the Holy Spirit tells us the truth. And so we need the Holy Spirit to remind us and to be able to help us to say to the enemy, you are a liar, that is not true. I don't have to run away from God. I know what he's given me. I wanna share this time with you when I felt God give me a very strong revelation about this idea of how the Holy Spirit helps us. And it was a time I turned 40 and my friend in London, I was going to see her, my friend in London had arranged a session of go-karting and I'd never done go-karting before. So I was really excited. I went there, you know, I haven't driven in a long, long time. I have my license, but I'm not the best driver. But I thought it would be just such a fun time. We'd be riding around a track, we'd be waving at each other, you know, going up and down. I thought this is gonna be so much fun. And when we got there, it was kind of, you know, in the waves of the pandemic. So there was not that many people. I remember going into the dressing room and they gave me this helmet and they gave me this suit. And I was thinking, why do I need these things? And we were getting changed. There was two other women in that changing room. And I remember thinking, this is going to be great. There's no one on the track. You know, we're going to have so much fun driving around, waving at each other. And then someone came into the room and said, come, hurry up, come out, come out. You've got your induction session. And I said, induction? What's that? And so... We were invited to this room where they had this video to induct us in, into how we are to drive. But when I went into that room, there was about 15 other men in that room. 
and they all had their helmets and their suits and the induction video was talking about racing and about being safe and about coming first and second and third. I thought, oh my God, I'm in the middle of this race with all these men. I thought I'd be waving at my friends and now I'm in this race. What am I going to do? And I was so scared because I'm such a bad driver. And so we get into our go-karts. I almost chickened out. I thought, no, I'm going to try this. And as we're going around, I just remember feeling that the wheel was so stiff. And we were coming around a corner, and I was so scared. You know, by then, people had already lapped around me, but they were coming up behind me again. And I thought, oh, my gosh, they're going to crash into me. And there was this tight bend that I had to get around. There was a tight bend that I had to turn around. And so I decided to try with all my might to turn that wheel to go around the bend. And you never guess what would happen. I just couldn't do it. I I wasn't strong enough. I couldn't turn that wheel fast enough. And I got stuck. I got stuck. And it was so embarrassing because this woman had to come with a flag and she waved everyone to stop. And the whole race stopped and everyone was looking at me and they had to pull me away from the wheels that I had run into. And then we were back on again. But I was just so embarrassed. We were supposed to go around the track, I think, a few times and I just chickened out after that. But, you know, God really spoke to me during that time. He spoke to me and he said, you know, Jess, this is how the Holy Spirit works. You know, because I was thinking to myself, I wish I had power steering. Why don't they put power steering on these things? You know, why do we have to try with all our might to get around those corners? And I felt God say to me, my Holy Spirit is like power steering when you are trying to change your mind and get around those bends. And and that's how the Holy Spirit works. We cannot change our mind or turn around just by ourselves. We need the help. We need the power of the Holy Spirit. And He comes in to help us. And He comes in to help us to turn around and change our minds. We are just to ask Him and invite Him in and say, I cannot do this by myself. Change me, Lord. Help me, Father. Show me, Holy Spirit, how to get around this corner. And the final truth that I believe that God wants us to embrace today is that we can enjoy the gift of repentance every single day. It's not just once we make that decision for Jesus. We can enjoy this gift, this privilege of being able to repent every single day. Luke 17 verses three to four says, so watch yourselves. If your brother or sister sins against you, rebuke them. And if they repent, forgive them. Even if they sin against you seven times in a day and seven times come back to you saying, I repent, you must forgive them. So if we are forgiving people seven times 70, there's also someone that needs to be repenting that much as well, right? As much as we're forgiving people, we are also to be repenting. James 5, 16 says, therefore confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I'm just gonna share one final thing with you. I really believe that one of the biggest transformations in our marriage happened when we understood this idea of our need to repent daily and to be broken and contrite, to be humble enough to understand that we all need the grace of our Saviour. And you know, it used to be in our arguments, I would point out my husband's sin, but when we did this marriage course, one thing I really understood was that before I point out my husband's sin, I need to look at myself. I need to ask myself, where have I missed the goal? Where have I chosen to be bent? You know, where have I broken my relationship with God? And you know, the minute I start repenting, I have so much more grace to give my husband, even if I think his sin is bigger than mine. And that has transformed our relationship, that we're not there to point at each other. We are there just to come and examine ourselves first. And that's something that we can do every day. We can bring ourselves to the foot of the cross and embrace the gift of repentance that he's given us and change our mind about sin. So these are the four truths that I believe God wants us to embrace today. One is that repentance is not a punishment, it's a gift and it's a privilege. Two is that God is not angry with you when you sin. Three is that we need the help of the Holy Spirit to turn away from sin. And the final one is that we can enjoy the gift of repentance every day. And now I just invite you, would you mind letting me pray with you? If you wouldn't mind standing up and I would love to pray for you. And I just want to ask you, do any of you, have any of you heard about that revival in Ashbury? You know, that's been, we've been seeing reports on the news and, you know, I don't know what's true, but I heard that there was maybe 15,000 people just coming to Christ or coming to visit every day. And you know, I heard a report that it was actually began with this act of one person just confessing their sins and repenting. 
Uh, but, and whether that's true or not, I don't know. But what I do know is that revival happens when we come to God broken and repenting that he's not been our first love. And we ask God to give us that first love again. And why I'm sharing that with you is because I think it's important that we understand that we should never underestimate the power of our repentance. When we come to God and we repent, the power of it to transform us, the power of it to transform our relationships, to the power of it to transform everyone around us. There is power in repentance. And I would love you to let me pray with you today. Father God, I thank you so much, Lord, that there was an amazing transfer that happened on the cross, Lord. Lord, you didn't hold us accountable to our sin, Father. You didn't come to judge us or condemn us. Instead, Father, you came just to convict us, Father, Lord. And Lord, you came to take away our sin and our shame and our punishment and our condemnation. Father, you transferred that all onto Jesus on the cross. And what you gave us instead was his righteousness. Thank you, Jesus. And Lord, you finished everything on the cross. And all you ask of us today is that we would just change our minds. And it's not even something that we have to do ourselves. You come in by the power of your Holy Spirit to help us turn around and transform, Father. Thank you, Jesus. We have everything in you. And Lord, I just really want to come against the lies of the enemy, the lies that the enemy tells us that we are ugly to God, that we are disgusting to God, that He's angry with us, that we cannot approach Him, Lord. Lord, and I pray that you break those lies in the name of Jesus, Lord, those lies that have been whispered to us, those lies that we tell ourselves sometimes. Break them in the name of Jesus, Father. And Lord, give us a fresh revelation of your goodness and your grace over our lives, Lord. I ask this all in Jesus' mighty and precious name. Amen, amen.